God is good, y'all, and I am so incredibly thankful always to be home at the way. Amen? And to be among my people, I give God thanks and praise for my beloved who are back home, for Dedrick, who's holding it down today, to Coltrane, who's little Mr. Shaw in the Shaw University coronation today. We shout out, Coltrane. Love you, baby. Take good pictures in your white tuxedo. Amen, amen. Amen. And to Pastor Tanisha and to all of my people, I'm so incredibly thankful to my sister Renee and your presence. Um, God is good. Amen. 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 We're going to dig in because I know it is um, football Sunday. Amen. And it is Eucharist Sunday. Amen. Um, order of importance, not in that order. Um, <laughs> uh, but... But yes, so we do. We give God thanks also for all the people who have served, both seen and unseen. Amen. In worship, right? For the people who make um, this worship experience and the way we usher God into this space and invite God in possible every week. So I will be reading today from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 6. <clears throat> And for those of you who know me, you know that sometimes we read quite a few verses, but that isn't necessarily an indication of how long the sermon will be. Um, so for anybody who knew, don't get scared. Amen. We'll start reading at verse 8 and read through the end of the passage. It reads as follows. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzziah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzziah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of the Lord. And so David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf, wearing a linen epoch. David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. And while he and all of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and sounds of trumpets, as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched him from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. And they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it, and David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. And then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and the cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went to their homes. And when David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of servants as any vulgar fellow would. And David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes, but by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. 
wild seeds. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Hmm. Gracious God who makes all things sacred, please breathe upon us and breathe in this space that we may feel secure enough to lay down anything that we brought in here, that we may be free to be fully naked before you, fully ready to receive what you wish to give to us and not what we think we need. And so God, speak and let all of us in our hearts listen, in our minds receive, and in our bodies change of behavior. Bring transformation to your people, God, through the speaking and hearing of your word. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So I am an Octavia Butler fan. And in her book, Wild Seed, one of the main characters is named An Wan Yu, who has lived for over 300 years. And she has the ability to shape shift and heal. So for more than three centuries, she has practiced learning her body well enough to know when something is off and then targeting that place in order to heal it. And in one portion of the book, she starts to explain how it is that she has um, dealt with or navigated the many enemies that have come for her over the years because of their fear about what they don't understand about her. And this is what she says. She says, over the years, I have come to be better at healing than my enemies are at killing. Which means, y'all, that year after year, century after century, the fears of people about her did not die. One enemy would die and another would rise up. And so she said, I need to change my response. And my response is to become so good at killing, at healing, that those who come to kill me are not as skilled in their craft as I am in mine. Sometimes, y'all, in the fight, we forget that at times, the greatest defense is offense. Wild seeds in this context within the book describes those like Anwan Yu and um, those who have special abilities, okay? But they have special abilities and they are unwilling to be controlled by indoctrination. They describe those with special abilities who are unwilling to give up their human dignity and autonomy in order to be objectified solely because they have special abilities. Wild seeds. King David is entrusted with caring for the Ark of the Lord. And you all, the Ark of the Lord was so synonymous with God that it was actually named the name of the Almighty. That was the name of the Ark, all right? And when we enter into our text today, um, David has witnessed one of his people, right, being killed because he mistakenly touched the Ark. And this invokes fear in David, and he is not just afraid, but he's angry with God, right? For something so trivial, right? Causing the death of one of his people. And so he says, you know, like, I don't want this anymore. He is unwilling then to care for the ark. He takes the ark to a man by the name of Obed-Edom, and he leaves it there, right? And because of Obed's carrying of the ark. God blesses this man and his entire household, and some translations say everything in his house was blessed. And so when David hears this, he's like, oh, okay. I think I need a blessing in my house. He goes back. And so whether he realizes he needs a blessing in his house or whether he realizes that it's actually an honor for him to be given the responsibility of, of caring for something so incredibly divine. It elicits gratitude in him, right? And in this gratitude, he and all the people with him begin to dance. And y'all, when I say they dancing, I mean like, this ain't no like cute little two-step. 
all right? This is an all-in, sweat-soaked, clothes coming off, lipstick smeared, mascara to the high line, right? Kind of dance. It's full, unabashed abandon. David sang with the actions of his body what his language can't seem to reach. And so he continues on with the people And the passage says that his wife, Michal, who is the daughter of his predecessor, King Saul, sees him and she despises him in her heart. You all, the word despised here actually means contempt. Okay? Now, one psychologist that once taught me said that the one thing she's never seen a couple be able to overcome is contempt. And so she despises him and she has contempt for him. He comes on into the city, he performs the appropriate rites, he feeds the people and he heads to his home in order to bless it. But before he can reach the threshold, Michal is out the door and she is lighting into him. Oh, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, running around naked before the Slave girls of servants as any vulgar fellow would. King David responds, mm 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 It won't before you or anybody else. It's before God that I was dancing today. God who chose me over your father and anybody else in your father's line to be king of Israel. It was before God, and I will be more humiliated than this, more undignified than this, but don't get it twisted. These slave girls you speak of, in their eyes I will be held in honor. And then it says that Michal died having no children. An odd thing, in my opinion, to appear at the end of this passage, but it's there. Amen? Wildflowers grow in some of the unlikeliest of places because the wind carries their seeds and they land wherever they land and they must learn to thrive right where they are. Now, some of us in here know and understand what it feels like to be carried to places and situations and experiences in this life that are beyond our control. We know what it's like to be at the whim of other people who take us into situations where it's hard to thrive. And what I'm saying is that I believe this passage today allows us to have a little bit of hope It allows us to see that there are places where we can look to learn lessons of healing, okay? Lessons of healing that help us to learn how to thrive in situations that are beyond our control. And what this passage also teaches us is that oftentimes those most poised to teach us the lessons are not those that are centered in the story are not those that are centered in the story. I believe that there are a few wild seed teachers in this passage. And if you're okay with walking with me, we're gonna visit a few of them, amen? The first wild seed teacher we find in this passage today is Obed-Edom, is Obed-Edom. So over the last few years in my work, there are certain themes that are reoccurring in people's lives. And one such theme reoccurs in the lives of black women and several women of color that I've sat with. And one experience that is reoccurring for several of the people that I've worked with is that these women will be um, applying for leadership positions that they are well qualified and well prepared for, but are often overlooked and um, others are hired over them who are often less qualified, amen, Lauren, and less prepared, amen? And some of them go months, some of them go years, still applying until finally they get the job. And once they get the job, they realize that the job that they were given, they were handed a full out mess. I'm talking low morale, 
I'm talking toxic work situation. I'm talking about high turnaround on employees. And most of them, most of them, y'all, nothing is absolute, but most of the women that I've sat with who find themselves in this situation, and it is plural, more than, this is a reoccurring experience, okay? Most of them vent and lament, and then they roll up their sleeves and they get to work. Amen? And they're like, I asked for this, I got it, now I'm gonna do my best at it. Now in most cases, again, not all, but in most cases, one of three scenarios is the outcome. One, they turn it around and somebody else gets the credit. Two, they aren't able to turn it around. They are blamed for the problem and it becomes the means or the basis for either their demotion or their dismissal. Number three, they turn it around and the powers at B or over them decide that they want to quote unquote elevate them. So they move them out of that position into an equally as toxic and broken position and they put somebody else that they like in the position they were in to reap the benefits of the hard, brilliant work that they did. And by the time they get to me, y'all, they are exhausted and they are enraged and they are not trusting of their own worth or of the systems that they move in to ever see their worth. And their first step in healing, their very first step, is to learn to retrace the ways God showed up for them when others did not. The anchoring of their healing, y'all, was learning to trust God amid the voices, even the voices that it made it within them, that were untrustworthy. David was king. And David was not willing to take the risk of carrying the ark that was entrusted to him. He said, I don't want the responsibility. It's too dangerous. It was almost as if he was saying, no, I'm too important. Right? But Obed Edom, maybe not so much. Now, it's important that we know some things about Obed, okay? One, Obed was from a place called Gath, which was in Palestine. And for anybody who knows anything about Israel and Palestine, they are still in tension today, right? So he was a Palestinian. But then First Chronicles also says that Obed and his father were doorkeepers, in the house of the Lord. Doorkeepers were the lowest station you could hold in the house of the Lord. Some of you will remember Psalms, right? I'd rather be a doorkeeper than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Okay? So I want you to understand what is happening here or what is potentially happening here. Now, there are many reasons, y'all, I ain't even gonna lie, many reasons why David could have took it to Obed, one of which has to be that he was trustworthy, right? But I must admit, knowing what I know about Obed, David's actions are a little suspect. <laughs> Just a little bit, right? It's almost as if to say, you know, no, my kids can't play near that dump but you and your kids can, and you ought to just be happy that we letting you build your house anywhere. So you go on over there and you smile and you drink your poison water and you, you know, breathe your toxic air and you make sure your house is worth less than mine and you pay a higher interest rate and you should just be happy. And then in a few years when I decide that what you got is better than what I got, I'm gonna come back and take it, gentrification. Because ain't that what David do, pastor? That's what he does. He find out the man get blessed, and he come back and what? Let me get my ark back. Yeah. Let me get my ark. It doesn't matter if Obed-Edom was willing or not to accept the ark because of the power dynamic between him and David. Who is going to refuse the king? There was no choice. And if I were Obed, that would not elicit trust in my leader. But God, but God, y'all, God 
blesses Obed in the midst of a situation that is beyond his control, beyond his ability to say no. And he doesn't just bless Obed, he blesses his whole household and everything in his house. But God, this first wild seed teaches us that we must learn to trust God amid those who prove themselves to be untrustworthy. When you find yourself in a place where you can't trust the person or a system or a process, I need you to stop and start to pay attention to how God is showing up to prove that God is trustworthy. The second wild seed in this passage comes in the form of a group of slave girls. When I was serving as chaplain at Meredith College in Raleigh, North Carolina, a choir, a children's choir from Haiti came to sing in chapel one Wednesday when we were having worship. And the American sponsor that was supposedly introducing them stood up and commenced to take the majority of the time allotted for them to sing, to talk about their experience as Haitian children, which surprisingly was very much full of details of how horrible their lives were before she came into it. And so in this self-aggrandized monologue, She took up so much time that these babies only had about 10 minutes to sing by the time they got up. Her lack of self-awareness, right? Her lack of self-awareness in thinking that she was um, in a place in relation to them that she was not, didn't allow her to fully see them. So you can imagine my surprise, y'all, when I found out that some of these babies were actually teenagers who spoke perfect English, which means they could have what? Told their own story. David was an unlikely king, okay? He was not in the line of succession of King Saul. He was not um, King Saul's son, okay? He was a skilled musician, and after he slayed Goliath, right, with that slingshot in the stone, he became an excellent military strategist and leader, all right? And so it suffices to say that he had a very unlikely, right, movement to the throne. And he was very grateful of that. He was very mindful of that. I don't take that away from him. And anyone who has that level of gratitude does. We have like this kind of like uninhibited praise to God when you are overwhelmed by so much gratitude. And so in this way, I believe that David, what David hints at is true about these slave girls, right? I would imagine that these slave girls who are the slave girls not of David, they are the slave girls of David's servants. Don't get much lower than that, okay? They do understand. We know that those who live very um, close to the bottom in a society, right? Particularly people of faith, they understand what it means to be desperate for God. They understand what it means to be totally dependent upon God. They understand that it is a greater risk for me not to be fully vulnerable with God than it is to be, right? And so they really don't care a whole lot about what people think about them and their faith when they are with God. So in that way, I think what David is implying about these slave girls is true. However, there is a difference between David and these slave girls. These slave girls would have day after day, moment by moment, reminders of how dependent upon God they are. They live in this place of knowing and hanging on in desperation of God, right? David, however, 
has these moments or experiences where he understands, it comes to his memory again, that he is desperate for God and dependent upon God. But David, in his privilege, would not have an ongoing daily reminder of this dependence because he is a king who has everything he needs. All of his necessities are always met. Okay? Now, my issue is that I'm not sure that these slave girls would agree with David that they go so far as to hold him in honor because of this brief overlap in their experiences. I mean, could it be, y'all? Could it be that maybe David overstretched how aligned he was with this incredibly marginalized group? He doesn't ask them what they think. He doesn't offer for them to say, how do you feel about me? He said, no, they will hold me in honor. I want you to imagine for just one minute that you overhear Pastor Mike and Pastor Tanisha talking and you hear them saying, oh no, they honor me. I don't know about you, but that sounds like you really lacking a whole lot of self-awareness. Even if you think it, guess what? Don't say it. You know, that's over the top, right? So we gotta, we gotta put this thing into perspective, right? So what are we saying here? We're saying this, these slave girls, based upon their position in the household, their position in society, are very much aware of their desperation for God. Now, it's not that all people, regardless of your station, aren't as desperate for God, don't need to be as dependent upon God. No, it's true for all of us. It's whether or not you're aware of it. And when you are aware of it, it means that you're not just naked before God when things are good. You're not just naked before God when things are bad. You are always moving in a vulnerable place with God. And what does this do for us? This means that we move differently. It means that we make decisions differently. It means that we trust differently. It means that we love God more deeply. And what were we created for but to love God? These wild seeds teach us these wild seeds teach us, y'all, that what we know about our relationship with God is more important than what other people think they know about us. What we know about our relationship with God is more important than what other people think they know about us. I have a dear friend of mine who's an educator and she educates educators. And she told this story to a group one time publicly, which is why I share it here, that she once had a student who came to her frustrated as she was student teaching about a little boy in her class who she self-described as being lazy and unwilling to learn. That she had tried to motivate him in several ways, but he had not responded. And so my friend looks at her and she says, okay, maybe that is the case. <clears throat> she says, but what else could it be? And she says, the girl kind of was caught off guard, right? She just kind of paused. And she then began to think about what else might be at play with this young boy. And she ends up naming two or three other options. And this became a turning point in this young educator's ability to impact children. Because when she re-approached this young boy, she approached him with a posture of love and curiosity, of not assuming that she already knew or understood a thing, right? 
And what she found was that he had a different learning style than the one that was being used in the classroom. And when he would be distracting in class, it was because he was embarrassed that he did not understand and was trying to cover his embarrassment. And once they changed his plan for learning and he was able to start to learn and be seen, all of the distractions ended. Y'all, how many of our babies never have an educator ask, what else could it be? The third wild seed is the most difficult one for me because it's me cow. It's me cow. Mikhail appears to be at the center of this narrative. But is she? But is she? It is very clear that David is at the center, right? And you all, I was challenged in my bias as I was reading this passage because just like I've always read it since I was a little girl, I saw Mikhail as the antagonist of this story. She was the one that was clearly wrong. She didn't get it, right? But it was that last line. It was that last line that did something to me. She died having no children. Why did that need to be put in there? Why? Now, some scholars, bless their precious hearts, <laughs> believe that her selfishness meant that she was not worthy of being in the bloodline of David. Ugh, <laughs> cringy, as my daughter would say, that's some cringy interpretation. Yeah. I think they got that wrong. I think they got that wrong. But what this question did was it elicited more questions in me. And so then I started to ask more questions. And the question then became, well, did she want kids? <laughs> and did she want kids with David? And after I settled down, I said, okay, I can assume that the answer is probably yes, because whether fair or not, in many cases in this situation and culture, a woman's worth and her worth as a wife was dependent upon her being able to have kids. And in her case, heirs to the throne. So yes, I can assume I would say that at some point she probably wanted to produce children with David. But then I realized that I didn't know enough about Mikal. And so I went back and y'all, she marries David in 1 Samuel chapter 18. And this is what it says. It says Mikal was in love with David. She loved him, y'all. Something happened between the time that she met and married this man to the time that we get to our passage where she is full of anger, contempt, and dies childless. She loves him. And she shows favor to him along with her brother, um, Jonathan, over her father. Yeah. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 19, she saves David from her father's plot to kill him. This woman loved this man. What I can't find is evidence of that that love was mutual. I do find evidence of the mutual love that existed between her brother, Jonathan, yeah and David, but I cannot find evidence that David loved Mikal. Y'all, the very part of her narrative that would elicit compassion from the reader is missing from the text. The part that tells us what in the world happened, and we know, y'all, we know that something, a lot of something's happened between the 
fact that she loved this man to where she ends up, a lot of things happen to get her to the place where she is triggered by this man's dancing. Her content won't about him dancing and praising. Her anger won't about his praise. It was about him. It was about him. Y'all. Even when Mikhail speaks about these slave girls, we are often distracted by her energy towards David, but she actually makes some inferences to these slave girls that we miss. Notice what she says. Oh, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today going around half naked before these slave girls of his servants like any vulgar fellow would. She implies that these slave girls' opinion of David should hold weight with him. She implies that he should care about what they think about him, which is very different from assuming you already know what they think about you. Mikal's story, Mikal herself, is not at the center of this narrative, but our judgment of her is. And though we do not know if she was able to receive any healing before she dies, what her experience in this text teaches us, what it shows us, could very well be the premise and the catalyst of healing for somebody else. What does this wild seed teach us? She teaches us that when there is an absence of compassion for another human being, it is well worth our time to pause and consider why. To pause and consider why. We must learn. We must learn to heal better than our enemy heals. And if we're going to do that, we must know where we need to go to learn the practices of healing. And that those places often reside not with those at the center of the story for whom the story may not even be about, but that the lessons that we learn about healing most often lies with those not at the center of the story. Wild seeds in the name of the one who lives and reigns and breathes with the one true God. In Jesus' name, amen.